to uh, kindly stick in. And the other thing that the uh, Irish Republican, sorry, Irish Socialist Republican Party did is they, they, they founded and launched Ireland's first Marxist newspaper, the Workers' Republic. And you can really see, if you go and read some of those writings, calmly working out a whole set of political questions um, that, I, that I still think are uh, very relevant today. I mean, socialism and religion, reform and revolution, uh, the Gaelic, Gaelic revival, which was quite... Uh, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, taken off in Ireland. Conley had something to say about that in terms of the defence of the Irish language and other minority languages in a context where you like the idea of global communication. Uh, so Conley was already laying out a kind of socialist position on some of these, uh, some of these uh, political, political questions. And, and, uh, and those are very worth reading. And I think what they allowed Conley to do, and these were all popularised <coughs> arguments, they were very rarely written for, you know, for what would be an academic audience, or uh, they were always written with a view to kind of work women over a working class, a working class audience. And you, you, know, you can really tell that from the kind of language that's used. But they really helped Conley, I think. It laid the basis for Conley's thinking for, for his, um, I think, most profound piece of work literature, which was Labour in Irish History. Um, and there's a couple of main arguments that I think he drives through in that booklet, which again is worth, worth reading. And I there's three thirds of one at the back, is that right, Pete? Um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, the, the main arguments Conley, what Conley does is he looks throughout Irish history and he looks at all the periods where there's been the 700 years of oppression by the British and all the rebellions. And he basically says, right, we'll go back and look at that period. And he looks at the, the social forces involved and he says, in every one of these struggles, the struggle has been betrayed by the Irish bourgeoisie or the Irish middle class. They betrayed the working class. Um, and so Connolly advocates in this pamphlet, he's against a union of classes because it always led, leads into betrayal for working class forces. So he argues, his pamphlet is about saying, the only social force that will liberate Ireland or see it through until the end is, uh, is the Irish working class. Uh, which again, I think, was a profound political breakthrough in terms of thinking about a national liberation movement uh, in, the co you know, in, in a col colony um, and thinking about it, uh, it, it points in that direction of uh, permanent, permanent revolution as well. Um, and I think that that is uh, you know, still a, a very important contribution. And again, he had taken these ideas from John Leslie, that series of meetings that John Leslie had done on the Irish question in, in Scotland where Leslie basically looked at the same question, the same issue, and said, why is it that in all of these struggles, uh, work, the working class or the labourers give the most blood, right, in terms of the, the actual struggle against landlords and British rule, but they've got the least control over the actual direction of the movement. And so Connolly's argument and Leslie's argument was that the working class needed to gain control of the political movement that they were, um, that they, that they uh, were at the, at the centre of. Uh, and I think that that is Connolly's thinking then, and uh, how do you how do you unite the the national liberation struggle with the struggle for a socialist republic, which he uh, which the uh, the Irish socialist republican movement was very effective in um, in doing. Uh, so the, the Irish socialist republican party got into a lot of difficulties. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with uh, poverty um, and also to do with. The uh, prospects for building a mass working class uh, organisation in the Ireland at the, at the time, and Connolly ends up going to the United States. And there's another thing about Connolly that I think is very, very important. Connolly's ideas definitely changed each time he had a grapple with a different set of political realities. Um, he often it, he did it in isolation, or he figured it out himself in debates with him, com his comrades and so on and forth. But in the United States, you can really see a transformation in Connolly's in Connolly's thinking. He goes there and he joins the uh, the Socialist Labour Party, which he which was the in some ways the leading revolutionary organisation of the time that were holding the line against opportunism and reformism that was entering into the the, uh, uh, the Socialist International, the Second International, the Socialist International. Um, but he ends up having a fallen out, basically arguing that they're sectarian and they, they, they are, uh, they're abstaining from real life working class struggles. And there was a whole debate about how they understand wages and profit, but the, the core of that debate was about are we going to involve ourselves in trade union work and building and supporting rack and file working class struggles 
Um, and Connolly came on the side of it all saying, we have to, as socialists, we have to prioritise and be involved in these, in these struggles. And so he's also, he joins up with the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, uh, were founded in 1905. Um, in part inspired by the mass strikes, uh, the, the revolution in Russia, but also a whole series of massive labor, labor battles in the US. And Connolly uh, becomes an organizer for the IWW. Um, and he, and he, uh, if you read his, his pamphlet, Socialism Made Easy, it's still, it, it, was, it was actually his most popular pamphlet. Um, and I think you can get a sense from that of his, uh, his um, commitment, that, you know, some of the things that he, that he, that he uh, wrote about. Again, this is just, you know, for people who, uh, uh, actually reading some of the things out that Connolly thought about socialism, I didn't get to do it, but some of them are very, very optimistic and are almost awkward to read because they're so optimistic. This is Connolly writing in 1898, right? And this is awkward for, I think, for people who come from a Republican tradition or a nationalist tradition that think Connolly was all about liberating Ireland. He writes, uh, writing in the Workers' Republic in 1898, Socialism represents the dominant and conquering force of our age, the hope of the worker, the terror of the oppressor, the light of the future, workers of Ireland, so that that light. And you know, his, his writings are all about that kind of stuff. There's another writing, again, from 1898. The day will come, perhaps like a bolt from the blue, when the, when the kings, kaisers, uh, queens and czars uh, and capitalists who now oppress humanity will be hurled from their place and their power uh, uh, and the emancipated workers of the earth will find a new society. I think that this is Connolly's core uh, from when he joins the socialist movement uh, in Scotland in 1899 right through until 1916. I don't think that core ever, ever fundamentally changed. And so when he's writing Socialism Made, uh, made Easy, this is a pamphlet that, that was very popular, uh, uh, you know, sold in workplaces, uh, in the US, in Ireland, across Britain, and Australia. Uh, and one of the things he writes about again is, he's at, he's at, he asks the question and then he responds to it as a socialist. That's how the, that's how the pamphlet works. Uh, he's asked, would you confiscate property of capitalism? And he says, uh, we would certainly confiscate the property of the capitalist class, but we do not propose to rob anyone. On the contrary, we propose to establish honesty once and forever as the basis for our social uh, relations. So that's Connolly's socialism uh, in 1910, because that's when, um, 1908, 1910, when socialism made, made easy is, is, is published. And in that pamphlet as well, if you read it through, because it's quite long, uh, he actually, you can see Connolly trying to figure out the relationship between party and mass working class struggle, right? Because some people say that he never really worked it out. I think if you look at that, he actually comes to a pretty clear understanding of what kind of party uh, needs to be built. Because he argues with people in the IWW who are rejecting politics altogether and in disgust at reformism and opportunism. He argues against that wing who say we don't need political parties at all. We should just focus on building the one big union. And Connolly's argument is that uh, you, you know, uh, he agrees with the idea of industrial unionism, uh, building one big union, but he says that the, the, the party that does get built needs to be animated by those working class struggles um, and can't be a sect. It has to rise up and be based on uh, the uh, you know working class struggles, which I think was a change from even his IRSP days, which was quite propagandistic. Uh, you know the the, the the reported and working class struggles, but they didn't really see workplace organisation and rank and file um, activism as the heart and soul of a working class movement that would lay the basis for workers having the confidence to seize control of their workplaces. And this is the conclusion that Connolly reaches uh, through his time in America. Uh, you know, that idea of the one big union is about workers actually seizing control over the, over the economy and that that lays the basis then for, a, for, a, for workers' control uh, and, 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 and so on. Um, so those years in the US, uh, Connolly goes through that kind of uh, change in the way he thinks. When he comes back to Ireland in 1910, he is immediately out building the Socialist Party of Ireland, writing for it, arguing that big changes are about to happen in Ireland and the revolutionary left or the socialist left has to, has to, be, has to now get prepared. He was all, also able to join the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, which had been founded by Larkin after a series of uh, you know, battles. Um, which was, was growing uh, quite uh, quickly across Ireland. Uh, and Connolly ends up being their uh, Belfast organiser, and that's where he comes face to face really with 
uh, the sectarianism in the north. And I think his argument about, he said, look, we have to build a bridge to Protestant workers, um, but we can't do it by temporizing in the face of the Orange ascendancy. So we have to try and win them on a class basis, but we also have to challenge bigotry and anti-Irishness, and we have to challenge the idea that the union is a good thing. And we, and because there was socialists at the time that tried to avoid taking up that question on the basis that it will just re-divide people, Connolly was adamant about, and it, it didn't bother him that he became unpopular for making that for making that political argument. So just to kind of finish you off right now, I want to move into his thinking. I think about 1916 because again. The argument is that he abandoned uh, socialism for nationalism, um, and uh, I don't think that it was true. I think he was he was faced with a series of uh, things that you couldn't imagine. Uh, one thing is, I don't think we give enough credit to Connolly and other socialists who were uh, living through the hell that was the First World War, right? Because this was war on an industrial scale that people had never seen before, and I think people were thrown into complete. Uh, completely uncharted territory, in the sense that if if there was actual global climate, uh, if global climate change came through and we see New Orleans everywhere, I don't know how socialists would deal with it. We would be in in, in, in uncharted territory, and I think that this was very new for them in terms of uh, you know the mass slaughter that was taking place all around them and the destruction. And of course, there were several things that created uh, what was a political crisis. For Connolly and the and, and the socialist movement, first of all, the defeat of the lockout meant that Connolly's vision of seeing a working class seizure of politic of, of the economy uh, was put off the agenda for a while. He actually says, if the if we had won the lockout, we would have went about our revolution in a different way. Uh, so that's one thing: the defeat of the lockout. It didn't destroy uh, uh, the, the the transport workers union, but it definitely uh, set it back. Um, the second thing was Connolly was quite optimistic about uh, the, uh, home rule uh, becoming a reality and he, he believed that it would change the uh, political debates in Ireland because, it would, it would, uh, because employers wouldn't be able to hide behind green and orange that would then divide workers over uh, on sectarian lines. He thought it would be much more straightforward where uh, orange and green employers would be united and run in running Ireland and then Labour and Socialists could operate in opposition. Uh, uh, to that. That didn't materialise and what ended up happening was partition which Connolly said would produce uh, and I think that he was absolutely right about this, a carnival of reaction both sides of the border, two reactionary states, an orange one in the north and a green one in the south that would have a devastating impact on the capacity of the labour movement to fight because it would divide the working class. The third one is in response to the Great War where the socialist movement uh, collapses into chauvinism and support for the war. And Connolly turns around and says, what happened to all our resolutions developed over years? What about the, the, the sacrifice that's uh, went into building the socialist movement? Uh, where, what has it all been for? Uh, and I think there was many socialists who, uh, whose instincts were right in terms of opposing the First World War that reacted in that way. Uh, many of them became passive. Some of them were dragged, on, dragged along with support for the war. Connolly rejected that. Um, and was very, very clear from the beginning of 1914 as to what should happen. And I think that this is his perspective going into 1916. This is a, a, his ideas about it. He says, the signal of war ought to have been the signal for rebellion. The notes of war should have been the toxin for social revolution. So this is Connolly's response to the breakout of the war. He's calling for rebellion and revolution. He says, the socialist proletariat of Europe ought to have prevented the war uh, and all its horrors, even if it meant civil war. So Connolly's talking about civil war when other socialist leaders are on rec uh, recruitment stages, stages uh, for their um, uh, for their own their own governments, uh, and he says, uh, and I think this is again, this is this is what Connolly's about in 1914, right through this 1916, whatever the difficulties were. He says, starting thus, Ireland may yet set the torch to a European conflagration that will not burn out until the last. Um, uh, throne and the last capitalist bond in Devonshire will be shriveled on the funeral pyre of the last warlord. This, I think that this is just fantastic to read about Connolly in 1914. And I think what that means is he, he developed a perspective in 1914 that was we need to have, we need to seize this opportunity uh, for social re rebellion and revolution. Um, and, he, and he understands a number of things. One, 
If we strike a blow, the British state, the British army, are going to be pulled apart and weakened, or in a weakened position in Ireland, and that gives us an opportunity to strike a blow against them right now. He also understands that um, if, if there's a rebellion in Ireland, this could actually lay the basis for uh, uh, social revolution across, uh, uh, across, uh, across Europe. And obviously, a blow in Ireland uh, would, would have huge psychological damage on the British ruling class uh, because it's, you know, it's, right, it's their oldest colony and there's a rebellion in it. And what does that mean for their ability to rule the world? Uh, so Connolly kind of like grasped all of these things uh, uh, as he said about uh, making rebellion. Um, and so, you know, with, with a weakened labour movement, with a weakened socialist movement, Connolly looked for allies, and he found those allies in the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, and Connolly was at the forefront of advocating rebel, rebellion to the point where they were quite uh, worried that Connolly would, and the Irish Citizen Army that had developed out of the, 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 the 1913 lockout would go ahead and organise a rising by themselves. Um, Connolly was eventually co-opted into the leadership of the IRB's military, military council and they set a date for an uprising. And a, a, another thing about, about uh, another myth I think that is worth expelling or dispelling <coughs> is this idea that the rising wasn't popular. Because I believe this for a long time, I think most socialists. But the more you look at Ireland in 1915, there was a mass movement against conscription in Ireland that actually meant Britain was afraid to include Ireland in in automatic conscription that Connolly was at the centre of. All the labour bodies in Ireland had taken a position against the war, against supporting the British government. The, the Dublin Labour Council, um, the uh, Irish Transport and General Workers Union, the Irish Trade Union Congress had all come out against the war. So there were, I think that there was, uh, like in many countries, there was an immediate uh, early enthusiasm for the war, driven by the media, driven by the state, driven by the church, driven by the Irish Parliamentary Party. But with the deaths and the slaughter coming back as news, more and more people were beginning to question the war. So Con I don't think Connolly and the other rebels were isolated. I think that they've seen a, a growing um, rebellious mood developing in Ireland. And then you look at the planning that they put into the 1916 rebellion. Uh, they were hoping that they were going to have 15,000 people in action uh, on that uh, Easter, Easter Sunday. Um, uh, with 20,000 guns coming from Germany, lots of ammunition. A lot of that didn't play out the way that they wanted. And of course then they went ahead uh, with, the, with the uprising. Um, so I'm just going to finish up by saying I think that... Uh, we have a tremendous uh, amount to learn from, from Connolly's experience. I think the one thing you can say is many traditions might claim Connolly. I think if you are someone who believes in revolution and overthrowing the social order, uh, Connolly is something that someone that we can celebrate and learn a lot from. I'll stop there.